Well, hello again, this is Kerry Herf, and welcome to our sixth class on Colossians. We'll be uh, looking at uh, chapter two again uh, today, uh, looking at verses eight through 15. So let me, um, let me get my screen to, uh, to pop up here. Today we're going to be talking about additions to Christ. Um, as we have seen, the Gnostics have been making a, um, a strong play to, to deny the sufficiency of Christ. Uh, we're going to get into uh, a little bit more about specifically what those Gnostics were saying uh, and how they were trying to subvert the church there, saying that Jesus is not adequate, that additions or uh, philosophies were needed in order to achieve salvation. Um, as, uh, again, most of you know, uh, who have been on this class or other classes of mine, it's always important to reflect on the blessings that uh, we have as Christians. So um, reflect upon, if you would at this time, one of the blessings that, uh, that God has granted to you this week. Uh, I am still in California with my daughter and son-in-law and, and Jamie, uh, as well as our grandson. And so what a wonderful blessing that uh, we have to spend time with them. We're hoping that we can get to see um, Scott and Cynthia also. They're only 383 miles away. Uh, so we're trying to see if we can do that too. But we do, um, we're planning to return to Columbus on Thursday and, and look forward to being with you uh, this Sunday. Uh, would also uh, like to encourage you to you know, look at the bulletin uh, for those of people that we need to pray for. Would certainly ask that you keep it, um, Jamie and I in your prayers as we travel back to, to Columbus. But I know there's a number of members of our congregation who are hurting or are still unemployed. And so keeping them uh, in your prayers would be, um, and especially knowing that, that our prayers are effective. And that they work. And so uh, please, uh, please do that for them. Okay, so um, didn't show this chart last week, uh, but again, it's relevant, uh, for, I think, just to kind of take a stop and look at, again at, at where we are within uh, the total context of the book. Um, again, you know, the overall theme is the fullness or the adequacy of Christ um, and the the all, all sufficiency that, that he provides for salvation and countering uh, the worldly views that uh, the Colossian church is being assaulted with. We're in this kind of middle section right here, um, the challenge uh, and the appropriate and all sufficiency of, of Christ. And so we'll be spending some, some time there uh, in, cha in chapter two today, uh, verses eight through 15 is also uh, next week. And again, um, you know, Colossians is written to combat worldly philosophy as well as Judaizing influences that are um, trying to take the church off course. All right, so let's let's get into Colossians two. Let me um, you know let me read for you uh, Colossians two, starting uh, in verse eight. Um, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Again, another body blow, a hammer at the Gnostics. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, you are also circumcised in putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by hands of men, but with circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So 
Um, you know, one of the thoughts here is um, given the 2000 years ish that now separates us from when Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians, it, it is a difficult passage to discern. Um, the, the Colossian church would certainly understand what, um, what Paul was talking about. We, we have to use a little bit of deduction to, to figure out exactly what Paul is, is speaking to. Uh, but it is clear that the teaching is Christ alone is not sufficient, that Christ plus something uh, was um, more efficient and, um, and, and the way uh, to, gain, um, to gain salvation. And so it's a big question mark that uh, the church is, is dealing with. So it's clear that this heresy had both Jewish as well as pagan influences. I mean, Jewish from um, the description about circumcision, which of course is, is a key, the Judaizing teachers are a key challenge to the church and, and a group that Paul has to consistently um, discuss and fight against. You know, certainly Galatians is a, is a key example there. The asceticism of some of the Jewish philosophies in terms of um, not eating uh, certain items, not touching certain items, holding certain festivals. And again, we also have discussed in previous classes the emphasis on intellectual knowledge. And also, there's a big astro astrology element um, in the passage that, that the, um, I learned this week that the ancient world was plagued with. And we'll discuss that a little bit more. So looking at, at verse 8, um, Paul says, don't let the false teachers carry you off. And, and the Greek word there really is talking about a traitor in human lives, you know, someone who is, is capturing and, and putting, unwill, putting unwilling people into bondage and, and taking them away. You know, and, and as we know, when we looked at, at Colossians back in chapter one, we've been transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And so for liberated Christians to submit themselves again um, to these, these laws or these regulations really is, is quite, quite troubling to, uh, to Paul and, and is, uh, is, um, could be fatal for the development of the church uh, and the Christians there. Um, so so Paul, Paul talks about you know, the philosophies, and the thought here is um, that, again, that there's something extra, that there's secret knowledge. Um, one of the one of the commentators that I used uh, to help prepare for the class today speculated that, you know, the, the Gnostics are saying, well, you know, Jesus didn't tell everybody all of the secrets. You know, he may have given some to, um, to Peter. He may have given some to Mary or, or, so, or some of the, the closer, uh, closer uh, inner circle of disciples that, that he had. So um, this, this human tradition that there is more than just Jesus is, is a basis of, of these philosophers. And, and he also, you know, Paul also talks about uh, the elements um, that, um, that contending with. Um, and, and apparently um, the ancient world was just uh, totally uh, taken in by the, the thought that there's spirits and demons in everything. There's spirits in the stars, there's spirits in nature, um, and very much thought, uh, dominated ancient thought. You know, were the, were, were the signs correct? And, and so you know, I have seen many times that you know, the, the Romans very much relied on, on portentous days to, um, you know, to do certain things. You know, the Ides of March uh, apparently was, was a very bad astrological time for Julius Caesar, or at least so the story goes. And so um, he was told to, be, to beware of the Ides of March. Turns out he didn't, um, and to his, uh, to his downfall. Um, so, so the Gnostics are saying, you know, yes, the, the elements are out there and, and they're against you, but with our secret uh, knowledge, our, our secret rituals, we can help you navigate that course and get you to, um, to salvation. And Paul says, no, no, the real knowledge is in Jesus Christ. And again, in, in verse nine, 
For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you've been given fullness in Christ. So we talked about you know, earlier in our earlier class that Christ is the head of the body. Um, Christ is also um, the head over every power and every authority uh, in the universe. Um, and so um, he is indeed all sufficient there. Um, Paul then goes on to talk about uh, the heresy um, and that demanding that Gentile Christians be circumcised. And again, a huge conflict uh, in the early church. You know, circumcision very much was a badge of God's chosen people in the Old Testament. Uh, it was uh, not only an outward sign that a, a person was part of the chosen people, but also even in Jewish thought, in Exodus and in Leviticus, um, Ezekiel, you know, talks about the circumcision of the heart, the circumcision of the lips, um, showing that um, you are committed to, to God and committed to living um, the right way for God, to putting aside things that uh, in the human nature that are indeed contrary to God. Um, and Paul says, yeah, the circumcision is, is not necessary because you have become united with Christ through baptism. And this baptism is uh, adult uh, baptism. It is in specifically instructed uh, by Paul um, and uh, is immersion. It's, you know, baptismo is the Greek word, of course, and that means full, full immersion um, it certainly requires faith in God. It's, it's, it, you, you cannot obviously take a person who is intoxicated and baptize them, um, and that, um, that that would be efficacious. That must be adult as well as requiring faith in God, requiring faith that God, who had the power to raise Christ from the dead, has the power to raise up us from the dead. And as we are bur you know, buried with him in the water, then we're brought up in newness of life. And I think Romans 6, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, uh, gives some additional insight into, you know, sin is indeed defeated, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but, but the importance of, of baptism and living the new life. <clears throat> So Romans 6, beginning in chapter 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And, and here's, here's where it talks about baptism. Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may, may live a new life. If we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ Jesus. So again, Paul goes on to talk about the condition that um, we were in when we were, um, when we were sinners, um, when we were dead in our sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code. So we were dead in our sins and we were powerless. You know, we couldn't move. We were, we were dead men. There's nothing that we could do to bridge the gap back to, to Christ. And, and God did this while we were opposed uh, to him. We were enemies. Um, and the great news of the gospel message is um, life is now available 
to all men, including Gentiles, um, which uh, to us today is, is not that big of a revelation. But, but what a groundbreaking, revolutionary idea that God was not just, his chosen people were not just the Jewish people, but everyone could indeed participate. And, and um, Paul gets, goes into a number of, of really uh, vivid images of how our sins are, are nailed to the cross. Um, in, um, in verse 13, um, he talks about um, having canceled the written code. Um, and so, you know, the concept here, or the Greek word here, is actually one of an IOU. It's a sign admission of, of debt. Um, you know, Deuteronomy 27 talks, you know, the people say, you know, let, let us, let us uh, be separated from God if we don't follow um, what God has, has asked us to do through, or has told us to do, instructed us to do through the law. Romans 2 um, you know, talks about even the Gentiles know. Um, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law, do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they don't have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciousness also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. So, so um, again, the sense that man knows what is right, either they're told through if they were Jewish through law, or that the, the law was written on their hearts. Those, those, that admission that we, we are sinful, that has been nailed to the, to the cross. Um, it's, it's been canceled. Uh, it's, the decree is, is no longer there. And, and that would um, that be something that would be very impactful as an image uh, to uh, the Colossian audience. When a law was canceled, um, it was in the marketplace, it was physically nailed to a board. Uh, so all could see in a public place. And in a very set, uh, very similar way, our sins are nailed to Jesus's cross. And things that get nailed to a cross uh, have been canceled. You know, we're, we're no longer beholden to sin, as we read in Romans. We are dead to sin. Sin no longer has uh, an eternal effect on us. Another image that uh, Paul uses is that our sins have been uh, blotted out. Um, and so um, this was uh, an, a, an idea that you know, apparently in the ancient world, you know, ink didn't have acid to it. And so whatever you know, papyrus or, or animal skins of this vellum, uh, ink was written on that, it, it could be erased. Uh, you could literally take the papyrus or literally take the, the vellum and, and wipe it away with a sponge and, and make it disappear so that because papyrus and vellum were so expensive, the, the scroll could be reused. And in the same way, that's, that's an image of our sins. You know, we have these these IOUs, these ordinances, the lists of all the things that we have done wrong and, and sinfully um, in our life. Um, God is going to block them away through through Jesus Christ. They're they're a race. They're they're no longer there to be read. Um, they are as far as east as the, as west can be um, in terms of the forgiveness that that God has has given to us. Um, and it really shows the power of God's grace. Um, we're no longer considered to be aliens. We're no longer considered to be criminals. We are now all sons and daughters who have wandered away, um, but had the opportunity to come home. Uh, and, and the imagery of the prodigal son is one that's so vivid um, in terms of this. God as the father welcoming back uh, the, the son who had left him, the son who was dead to him, but through the power of the cross, now we have the opportunity to return to the father who will reach out to us and embrace us in love. 
you know, the last imagery here is uh, Christ um, being triumphant. Um, Jesus literally strips his enemies of, of their power. And as I mentioned, in the ancient world, apparently, um, very much a belief in elemental spirits and in demons who are hostile and opposed to, to man. Um, and, and Paul says um, he has um, disarmed them. He's made a public um, spectacle of them, and uh, he has put them to shame. Um, and, the, and the imagery here is one of a, of a Roman general who's celebrating a triumph. And this is an image here of, of Vespasian uh, bringing in uh, the captives from, from Jerusalem. Um, they're led through the streets. They're often, uh, so the, the triumphant army goes first, and then all the captives come through. You know, the, the formerly princes and kings and, and rich people are now slaves. Um, and this is what, what, um, what Christ is going to do to, to his enemies, you know, the enemies of the powers of Satan, um, that um, he is ultra triumphant in all that he has done. And so you know, at this point, Paul is saying, what is this? What, what else is necessary? Christ is triumphant. Christ has conquered evil. Um, and so uh, you know, a, a passage that I think is, is instructive here also is 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 through 17. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance and knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we don't peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. So again, Christ is triumphant. He has put our, uh, those who oppose us to shame. And so, you know, as a, as a call to action this week, you know, I hope that you will be fortified with this, with this knowledge um, and act like men and women who are sent from God to be an example and a light in the world. Thank you very much. Um, look forward to, to being back with you in Columbus uh, come this Thursday. Uh, and again, you know, for those of you who are, who are worshiping, I look forward to, to seeing you on Sunday. All right, bye-bye now.